All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Ransom Reviews. Today, I want to talk about the Celtics preseason as it has finished. The regular season is going to be starting in just a few days. And I have eight different thoughts that I want to share today about the Boston Celtics preseason. Sure, they're probably all overreactions, but you can only react to what you've seen. And this is what I saw during the Celtics preseason and a little bit of summer league as well. So like I said, I've got eight thoughts that I want to share. Four of them are positive and four of them are negative. I'm trying to stay well balanced. That's the theme of this year's team and my mood towards this team as well is that of sort of like a well-balanced ambivalence, trying not to get too excited, trying not to get too down. Okay, so let's start. The first thought that I have from watching the Celtics preseason is the kids are all right. What I mean by that is Neesmith, Pritchard, Romeo, and even Grant Williams showed something in preseason that I just think makes you feel good. Um, we can go through these players one by one. If you look at somebody like Pritchard, Pritchard came in, you know, at a pretty advanced age for a rookie. He played all four years of college. He was ready to play right away. And that hasn't changed. He's definitely gotten a little bit better in a few areas, particularly with his dribble pull-up. Uh, that's something that he's added to his game for sure. There's no question that he's looking to be more of an offense initiator, a playmaker. I don't think that this is necessarily one of his natural abilities, but I do have a lot of faith in Pritchard for a couple of reasons. First, he's the best three-point shooter on this team, and I don't think it's particularly close. Now, obviously, the volume isn't there to maybe justify that comment, but, I mean, I've been watching this guy hoop not only for the Celtics, but I watched some of his clips in Oregon. I've watched some of his, like, you know, he, his tournament play and stuff. Like, he's been hitting threes from that deep, deep range for a long time. It's There's no question that he has that in his arsenal. And... uh I only expect him to get better because he has a tremendous work, work ethic. This is another thing that you get to know about Pritchard if you take a close look. He works incredibly hard. Uh, that's why he's got such a good handle. That's why his shot is so deadly. Now, obviously, there are limitations to his game. Defensively, he gets picked on. He's not uh, very big. He's not particularly fast, uh, but he is, you know, he tries. And that can't say too much about someone who tries, at least on defense. But I, I really love Pritchard, and I really do think he's going to be an important part of this team this year. Moving forward, uh, it's nice to see, like I said, him adding a little bit of uh, nuances to his game with that dribble pull-up. And I just think that his three-point shooting, the range that he has, regardless of who else we have on this roster, regardless of his defensive liabilities, will make him get minutes. Um, because I don't think there's anyone else who shoots the ball like that on this team. So he looked, uh, he just looked great. He looked great in the summer league. He looked great in preseason until he had his nose broken. And I expect that he will look great in the regular season as well. Um, next guy up is, we can take a look at Neesmith, same draft class. Neesmith is a guy that I loved when we drafted. He obviously had a pretty underwhelming uh, rookie season. And to be honest, even for a year or two, you could, maybe look at his draft position and what he's expected to contribute to this team and, and feel underwhelmed, uh, especially maybe when you look at players drafted around the same area as him, like a Halliburton or a Precious Achua who are carving out nice roles on their teams. Uh, but I still have a lot of faith in Neesmith. And at this point, I, I can't quite separate whether it's, just because I like him and want him to succeed, or if it's because I actually think he will. I mean, there's no question that Neesmith can shoot the ball for sure, but it's not like a locked and loaded skill. I think we saw that a lot in this preseason is that uh, unfortunately he seems to be a guy who plays a lot better when he's given more. You give him more minutes, you give him more opportunities to handle the ball, to be involved in the offense, to take more shots, and he he can get you 20 points. Um, but I just don't think he's going to have that opportunity on this team. So I'm a bit uh, up and down on what I think is going to happen with Neesmith this year. 
but the reason I put it in the positive category is because there's no question that he looks better this year than he did last year. Okay. The game hasn't quite slowed down for him yet, but it has slowed down a bit. Um, his shot looks a little bit more consistent than it did last year where, you know, it started the year really rocky. He's also shown the ability to put the ball on the floor a little bit, get to the rim. Um, and, you know, he's still a hot mess on defense, but I, I also believe in, in Neesmith's ability to work hard and to improve on that end. You know, he's got great size. He, he seems like a really solid athlete. And uh, I know he's trying. So I want to believe that, that he'll get there. And I just, I don't know. He's had a couple of nice games. He's had a couple of really messy games. That's the Neesmith experience. But I still really believe in this kid. And honestly, I, um, I hope he gets minutes this year. And I hope that he earns them. And I hope that he just continues to develop. And maybe it's year three, Neesmith, that we're really looking at to kind of have a breakout. But I do have faith in Neesmith as well. Uh, and then we can get to Grant Williams, who, you know, look, I, along with most other Celtics fans, hated him last season. He was just awful to watch. He was slow, couldn't jump, um, small just limited in, in practically every area. The only thing you could say good about Grant last year is that his three-point shot got better. Um, I hated him last year. I wanted him gone. I wanted him in China somewhere, cooking noodles, uh, starring for some team. I just didn't want him here. But uh, Grant? <laughs> Grant looked all right in the preseason. Um, he's definitely lost some weight. So... He's not quite as slow as he was last year. I mean, last year was just brutal to watch because even though he'd sort of bulked up to play the five, he was not big enough to guard traditional NBA centers. And he was too slow to do anything else. It seems like this year, he's probably still going to be too small to guard traditional centers, but I feel like his feet are moving quicker. And so, you know, we, our first year of the Grant Williams experience we all kind of felt like he was a solid defender. And I think that got blown out of the water last year when he was just borderline unplayable. Um, I don't want to say that he's going to be a plus defender again, because I still have real serious doubts about a guy who is basically like six, five and can't jump and uh, is quite slow for his, for his size, but he's definitely moving better than last year. And, you know, he's a smart basketball player. I don't think there's any, questioning that Grant Williams is a smart basketball player and that he wants to play well. I just think he has so many physical limitations that you're never quite sure what you're going to get. What I have seen from him again is quicker feet, a uh, better defensive positioning and his three, three point shot is like, it's legit. I mean, I, I legitimately think that he can shoot 37% from three this year. I, I really think he can do that as long as he doesn't try to do too much, you know, on his catch and shoots, his, his shot looks good. So, I mean, I think he can actually do something for us this year, which is why he's on the positive list. Him doing something is better than what he did last year. And the last one, and the reason I saved it for last is because I think it's the biggest development, and that is Romeo Langford. Um, for anyone who follows this channel or has listened to me talk before, you know that um, I gave up on hope on Romeo Langford a long time ago. I just never really saw it. Um, I know he played hard on defense and you kind of get these flashes from him sometimes. I know he's got great size. I know he had the high school pedigree, but like I never saw anything that made me think this is a kid that could score the basketball. Um, and I never saw anything that made me think he could be healthy. Now the healthy thing is still obviously to be determined. This kid's never played. Uh, I don't even think even more than half a season. So we'll see if he can stay healthy, but let's just assume that he can stay healthy. What we saw from Romeo Langford in the preseason, first of all, was his three-point shot has completely uh, changed. And I know that it's a very, very small sample size, but some of this stuff, you just have to go on the eye test as well. And what you saw in preseason from Romeo Langford was a guy who had complete confidence in his catch and shoot uh, three-point ability to not only make it, but to get it off, to take the shot quickly, uh, a nice high release. It just looked like a fluid shot, which we've never seen 
uh, from Romeo Langford ever at any stage of basketball. And, you know, if you want to look at Romeo Langford as a potential three and D guy, which, you know, depending on where you stand on him, some people would say he's not even good enough to be that. And some people would say that's underselling what he can actually do. He could be more than that. He could put the ball on the floor. He might have some playmaking skill. Um, Needless to say, even if you just want to look at him as a simple three and D player, you need to be able to shoot threes. I mean, right. That's half of the equation. And he'd never shown the ability to do that before. I think his numbers in his first year were, were like 19% from three and last year, 28. I mean, these, those are horrible, almost unbelievable numbers. And uh, I don't know what his actual percentage was in the preseason, but he was making a lot of threes and not just making them, like I said, but they look good. Now, when he tries to do it off the dribble and he tries to do a little too much, I mean, he was shooting air balls that were like, <laughs> looked like somebody had spun him around 10, 15 times and put a blindfold on him and just said, shoot. Um, but again, I don't think those are the kind of shots he's going to be taking anyways during the regular season. He's going to be parked in the corner, just like Jalen Brown was his first couple of years as a Celtic. And he's going to be asked on to make those catch and shoot corner threes when they're open. And I think he can really do that. And I have just been like, I've done a complete 180 on my stock of Romeo Langford and <laughs> we'll see if it was smart or not. But like at this point, I feel like Romeo could be starting. He's played that well in the preseason. Uh, you know you can kind of trust him on defense, and he's big and he's switchable, and that plays into what Ime wants to do. And if he can hit those threes, you know, then that already makes him better than Josh Richardson, who I'm going to try not to talk too much about on this podcast. Okay, so that was my first point. The kids are all right. The young players the Celtics have all seem to be developing nicely. And, you know, nothing like explosive, nothing revolutionary. But like, look, like I said, if you're getting anything out of Romeo Langford this year, that's already more than what most of us thought even just a few months ago. The second thought I have from the preseason is that Ime Udoka, the Celtics head coach, seems to have the right ideas. What I mean by that is he talks about things that sound great, like wanting to be elite defensively wanting players to be held accountable, uh, more ball movement, more pace, less ISO. These things all sound great. And I like that he's got his head in that area. And the reason why I'm kind of hedging on this is because this is also one of my negative points that I'll get to later in the podcast. But he believes in the right concepts. Um, I like trying to get back to being elite defensively. I, I love the idea of less ISO and more ball movement. Um, he definitely has already proven that he'll hold players accountable when he suspended or, you know, benched Marcus Smart for a game for missing a, a team flight. He also pulled Grant Williams off the floor after whining to, to officials after a bad call. Now, he should have done that with Jason Tatum, because Jason Tatum cries to refs more than anybody else, but it's a star. It's something. Uh, it's more than we got from Brad, more fire, I think. So I like what I've seen from Ime so far. It's obviously early. Uh, my third point is that the role players this year are better than the role players last year. Um, now, I feel like some people think this is a home run, like, oh, we're so much better. I'm not sure that I would necessarily agree with that. I mean, what are you, are you looking at Marcus Smart last year as a starter or as a, a bench player? Um, you know, the biggest difference for me is that you've got core young players like Pritchard, like Neesmith, like Rob Williams, like Grant Williams, like Romeo. These guys were all on the team last year and they're all on the team this year and they're all better this year. I mean, there's no, there's no way that you can debate that. They're all better. Now, when you look at some of the other moves, is Josh Richardson actually going to help this team? I don't think so. But, um, you know, and then you look at Horford versus Kemba. I know Kemba was kind of a mess last year. He was a mess last year. He was definitely a mess last year. But he did still score like 19 points per game. So, like, I, I think that Horford is going to have a better effect on this team than Kemba for sure. But you can't just say that, that, that this, like, you know, that he's going to be way better because Kemba did, you know, put – put the ball in the basket sometimes for us last year. Um, 
just not, I feel like just not having Tristan Thompson is, is, and Jeff Teague is good for us. And um, yeah, I'd, Schroeder has looked, you know, I don't think he's shown everything that he will show, but I, I like Schroeder. I like what he brings to this team. I just think that he's a guy that if you need to plug him in as a starter, I think he would be fine in that role. Uh, if you need to bring him off the bench, I think he is fine in that role as well. You know, whether or not there's going to be drama about his, you know, him looking for a new contract, whether he fits on this team. I, I'm not that worried about it because I just think like, I think the Celtics are going to need guys coming off the bench that can score. And I think he's probably going to do that better than, than anyone else on this roster. If that's, if that's his role. So I do think the role players this year are better than last year. And the last one of my positive preseason thoughts is about Al Horford specifically, because I'm honestly quite surprised at how good Al Horford has looked. Now, hopefully this COVID thing uh, doesn't, doesn't mess anything up. Uh, it's kind of a bummer. I shouldn't be talking about negatives and a positive point, but it is kind of a bummer that like last year was the COVID season and already we've had two people out with COVID in the preseason. It's not a, not a great look, not a great start, but um, you know, hopefully he was vaccinated and, and he's asymptomatic and he can come back quickly and continue to show what he showed in the preseason, which is, which is an Al Horver that honestly, maybe it's just rose tinted glasses, but I don't see a big difference between the Al Horford we've seen in the preseason and the Al Horford that was here a few years ago. I mean, I know one of the reasons why we were so scared about extending him is, oh, he's, you know, he's in his 30s now. He's going to be 35, 36 by the time this extension ends. And what's he going to look like then? He's already declining. But the strange thing is, whether it's the, the sort of holiday strange year he had in OKC last year or whatever, but um, Al looks good, man. He looked quick. He looked uh, in shape. He looked he looked good for 35. Really, really good. Uh, unquestionably better than Rob Williams, which hurt hurts my soul to say. But uh, yeah, I mean, Al came in here. We weren't really quite sure what we were going to get out of him. And I think he's going to immediately be one of the most important players on this team because of what he offers in intelligence and quiet leadership and ball movement and a big that can theoretically space the floor. I just think this is going to be, you know, kind of like when he was here with Stevens, he was such an important part of the offense that Stevens tried to run and the defense as well. And I think it's going to be the same with Udoka. I think he's already kind of made himself invaluable. So now let's get to the negatives. Yay. This is, I hate to say it, but this is where my, you know, my Celtics fandom really shines. So there's a lot of talk. And this is kind of a mixed bag between positive and negative, because, again, we don't know yet. The vibe for this team certainly seems much better than last year, the mood. Um, but there's a lot of talk surrounding this team. Talk about being great defensively, about this team having the possibility to be an elite defensive team. It's just talk. Talk about uh, this team spreading the ball more and the evolution and the playmaking abilities of Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown. Again, these are things we talk about. And the reason why I'm stressing on the word talk is because we haven't seen it. If you look at the defense for the preseason, it was honestly like a mess for a lot of these games. It seemed like the team was trying to switch everything, like absolutely everything. And I don't know if this is, I know Udoka has talked about like, this is definitely one of our foundational principles that we want to use, but I don't like know how committed he is to it, or if it's just one of his schemes. I don't know if this is something that he thinks like, look, I'm going to use this. I know it's going to be messy at first. We're going to have to work through the kinks, but eventually this is what's going to lead us to being elite defensively. What I can tell you is that we're not very good at it at the moment. And if we're going to be continuing playing defense like that, uh, it's not going to be pretty at the start of the season. So this talk, again, talk of us being great defensively is just talk. I haven't seen it. Um, I know that we have the pieces there to theoretically be a good defense, but 
again, I thought we had that last year and we were a mess defensively last year, middle, middle of the NBA, I think. So I, I don't know. Um, you know, the defense is just an idea at this point. I haven't seen it. I have not seen it at all. And I gr- and granted, you know, we had Marcus Smart being suspended for a game. We had Al Horford and Jalen Brown getting COVID. We had Rob Williams got a sore knee, even though we just came off a really long break. Kill me now. But I haven't seen it. Um, another issue of talk, talk, talk is this, you know, we're going to spread the ball. We're going to play faster. We're going to we're not going to complain to the refs. But like, again, all of these things are ideas that we haven't really seen. Did the Celtics spread the ball around a lot more? Absolutely. Did it work? <laughs> I, I mean, the ball got moved sometimes to the to the wrong team. Um, and that will lead me into my next negative. Turnovers are going to be, they are already, and they are con- going to continue to be an issue with this team. We had almost 20 turnovers per game in the preseason. A lot of sloppy, awful turnovers. Um, to be fair, the number one perpetrator of, of that was Jason Tatum. I mean, Jay, you'd see games with Jason Tatum having five, six, uh, seven turnovers. And I'm just going to say, like, there's no question that the Celtics are still pushing this, like, we want Tatum and Brown to have the ball. We want them to be facilitators, playmakers. And I totally understand that because that is the that is the next step, the natural evolution that these two guys are going to have to make if they want to take that jump, if Tatum wants to jump from a, top 15 player to a top 10 player if brown wants to jump from a top 30 player to a top 15 player they have to make that jump but i don't know i genuinely don't know if they're going to make it um and while we're waiting to see if that happens what's going to happen is they're going to turn the ball over a lot and that's just gonna i don't see how that really fixes itself this is not a team that has a lot of natural facilitators if any uh, outside of possibly Marcus Smart so you know if we want Brown and Tatum to be handling the ball and passing the ball we're going to turn the ball over a lot and it definitely was a mess in the preseason and you know I obviously expect it to get better but I do I do think it's going to be like one of the major issues with this team for the whole year um, the next one is my next negative point is kind of a just a personal opinion, to be honest. Like there might be people, people out there that think I'm totally wrong. Uh, there might be people out there that say, Adam, let it go. <laughs> if you say that, you're 100 percent right. But I still think this team continues to be hurt by some confusing roster moves. So I'll just get this one out of the way because I always bring it up and I won't shut up about it. But I'm still angry that we traded Desmond Bain. Uh, when we drafted him and just gave him away for nothing because we didn't have the space to keep him. He's a starter in Memphis now. He's looked great in the preseason. And honestly, if he was on this team, he could be possibly starting for this team. I mean, I, I would think that he would be ahead of Romeo, Josh Richardson, Neesmith, um, all of those guys to start. So, yeah, why did we keep him? And because we didn't keep him, we go and get a guy like Josh Richardson. Josh Richardson. And um, I just don't think he's very good, honestly. Like, we'll see. We'll see what happens this year. They talk about him like he's this elite defender. I- I'm not sure that he's anything above, like, just above average. I-, I think he's a solid defender. He does sometimes make some great plays, but um, elite? I don't know, man. I, I haven't really seen it. Um, I hope I see it because that really is going to be where his value is going to have to come because his offense is a mess. I mean, his shot looks rough and nasty. I mean, his shot reminds me of Romeo's shot and his three point shot in his first and second year. It looks like a guy who's still trying to figure it out. And while that was okay for Romeo, a guy who was in his first, second year in the league, it's not really great for a guy like Richardson who's been in the year, uh, been in the league several years. And, you know, I'm just tired of this narrative that, like, that Josh Richardson is the guy that we saw that one year in Miami and that all the other years of his career are like, Oh, he had a down year. Like you need to flip that narrative. 
the one year that Josh Richardson had in Miami is the outlier. That's the one year he had where he was pretty good. And every other year he's been below average. So I think it's, you know, people need to realize that Josh Richardson is a below average player. That's who he is. And so I don't, I just didn't understand adding him to this team when you've got guys like Neesmith and Romeo who are going to be competing for those very same minutes who actually still might have some upside. Um, Again, I, I think it all hinges on whether or not he's this elite defender that they seem to think that he is. Um, I just, I don't know. I don't, I don't see it. I didn't see it in the preseason. I don't see how he fits on this team. You're talking about a guy who kind of was down in the dumps in Dallas because they didn't really need him. They were better without him on the floor. Dallas, like a team that's last year was clearly like worse from a talent standpoint than, than our team outside of, you know, of course, Luca he couldn't carve out a role on that team. And then we think that he's going to have a spot here. Like I just, nothing about the Josh Richardson trade makes sense to me. And I'm just really confused. I'm still confused that, that, um, that he's here. Uh, yeah. And then today we cut Jabari uh, Parker, who, you know, some people are really, really upset about this. I'm not one of them but it is a little strange. You know, he, he seemed to be a guy who at least could get buckets off the bench, um, which is always needed. And it seems like we cut him maybe for financial reasons. I'm not exactly sure. Some people are saying it's because he's a defensive liability. And while I do agree, he is a defensive liability. Like what about Ennis Cantor? Like Kenneth Cantor is the biggest defensive liability. So, you know, is Cantor, I guess Cantor is that much more valuable on the offensive side than Jabari Parker, which I don't know. I mean, I do think he is more valuable, but not that much more valuable. Um, So it's, again, it's just confusing. I'm not like roasting, cutting Jabari Parker. Like, again, I don't think he was going to be a huge important factor for this team, but just a bit strange, the timing of it, where it doesn't feel like um, we have easy points off the bench necessarily. He might have been a guy that could have done that. And again, going back to this whole thing, well, if it's because of our defensive identity, then why is Ennis Cantor here? Why did we trade uh, away Moses Brown for for Josh Richardson if, if we wanted to have um, – you know, bigs, power forwards, and centers that could fit this this defensive scheme, this switching mentality that that Ime Adoka has. Because there's no like when Cantor's in there, he literally destroys the defense. Like when you watch the preseason games and they're doing the switching, 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 and Cantor comes in, it literally just gets lit on fire. They they have to change their entire defense. And you know, now with Horford with COVID and um, Rob Williams with his grandma knees Cantor's going to be playing significant minutes for this team like this is not like a third string center if they're going to do double bigs with Robin and uh, Horford which I still hope they don't do but if they do that then Cantor's playing like what like 25 minutes a night I mean that's insane to think about but um it's way too close to being a reality and again if that happens you know forget this switching defense when he's on the floor and I just don't know how that works. So just some confusing roster moves, uh, in my opinion, the last, uh, the last negative that I'll get into is just, uh, the exhaustion of insert key player here being injured or not 100%. It's, it really just wears down on my morale as a Celtics fan. And I'm talking about going all the way back to IT's hip, um, to Kyrie's brain, his brain injury, to Hayward's foot falling off, last year to Kemba's knee. And now, you know, we've just gotten news that the entire low, lower half of Rob's body is just made out of wet spaghetti. It's it's exhausting. It's draining to not just have a single season where you can be like, these guys are are all healthy. 
they're all going to play or, you know, I know maybe that's just unrealistic. Maybe other teams, fans could tell me like, look, dude, that never happens. There's always somebody that's hurt, but um, it just seems never ending. And it wears on you. Like Rob Williams is the key to this team. When I say the key, I don't mean he's the most important player. I don't think he's the best player or nothing crazy like that. But I just feel like if this team wants to be an elite team, I think it's going to hinge on Rob Williams taking that step forward, becoming the guy that we've seen at times, but never seen consistently. The guy who can absolutely change a game defensively with his vertical ability and his long arms and, um, you know, a guy who can take this team to the next level and hearing the report before the season even starts after just a handful of preseason games that Rob Williams knees are bothering him, that he's got tendonitis, which is something that doesn't go away um, is just so depressing. And, and if you watched Rob Williams during this preseason, he looked awful. He looked awful. And I don't mean, I'm not talking about the missed jump shots that he had. I'm talking about the fact that this is a guy who is a vertical threat on offense and defense. He's a guy who finishes lobs. He's a guy who runs to the rim. He's a guy that blocks shots, that makes spectacular defensive plays. And he was a guy in the preseason that looked like he was jumping uh, with Grant Williams' legs. You know, he just had no, no ups, no spring. And it was concerning, but you could have just said, well, you know, maybe he's just taking the easiest preseason. But now that you see this report come out, talk about his knee, his jumper's knee, you know that it was more than that. It was obviously he's not healthy. And, you know, that's the story of Rob Williams. He's a guy with limitless potential that unfortunately just has a body that constantly betrays him. And we took a risk signing him to the contract. I still think it was a good risk. I still think that as this contract plays out, he'll prove his worth. But, you know, the hope, the hope was always that that contract was a steal and that he was going to be able to stay healthy and develop into this, you know, like all-star level player and that we were going to have this amazing value of a contract. And I just think that that looks, I'm not going to say impossible. I'm just going to say less than likely, you know, with these, with this news, with another report about his legs, his knees, and the season hasn't even started yet. And you look back and you hear his, his interviews where he's saying his goal is to play 60 games in a season. Like, there's not a lot of reason to be confident that Rob Williams is going to be the kind of key that this team needs to unlock that, that next level. So that's it. That's my uh, reaction, my meandering um, reaction to the Celtics preseason. My prediction for the, for the actual season isn't that far. I think Vegas has the Celtics pegged around 47 wins, I think. Um, I guess I would go a bit under my prediction is 46 and 36 and getting the fifth seed in the East with Brooklyn, my Milwaukee, Atlanta, either or Miami of New York or New York, all above us. I could easily see the Celtics sliding to six. Um, I'm not sure they would go as low as seven or eight unless some stuff really went wrong. And I'm not sure that I know a lot of people say this team has the potential to to be the third seed in the East. Yeah, sure. 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 They do. I just, um, I don't, there's nothing that I've seen in the preseason that makes me feel confident about saying something like that. You I mean, if you want to be optimistic and you want to hope for the best and you want to say Celtics are the third best team in the East, go for it. Uh, I'm trying to be a, a bit more uh, baseline objective with this team this year. I'm saying 46 and 36 fifth seed in the East. Not great, not bad. There is one thing I'll say. I'm going to end this on a positive note. Uh, I do fully expect this team to be more enjoyable to watch than last year. Now, let's face it, that's pretty easy to do, as last year's team was wildly depressing. It was like watching your parents uh, make love to each other. I couldn't even watch it at times. I had to close my eyes, turn it off, turn off games at times, which I haven't done in years. That's how bad last year's team was, and I really don't. I don't get the same feeling about
about this year's team. I just feel like they're going to play hard and they're going to try to play together. This is what I'm, I'm hoping. And that honestly, sometimes that's the most you can ask for. We have some young talented players. If they're going out there and they're trying, they're actually caring about these games and we can see that effort and that they're playing together. Even if we're not a great team, at least we'll be fun to watch. And I do think that's a real possibility. And that's really what I'm hoping for more than anything. This is not a championship team. I don't expect uh, any sort of championship talk this year, but at least if we can, if we can put forth a product that is competitive and a uh, tough nose and fun to watch, I would be happy with that. And I think it's a real possibility. So those are my thoughts about the Celtics preseason and also my predictions for, for the upcoming season. What are your thoughts? Did you survive this insanely long preseason uh, podcast? Do you disagree with any of my assessments on what I saw during the preseason? Where would you rank the Celtics um, in the East? Where do you think they'll finish during the season? What do you think the record will be? I might as well ask 10 other questions since uh, you're probably not going to answer them. Anyways, what's your, what's your mother's maiden name? Uh, put that all in the comments below, and we'll see you next time on Ransom Reviews.